Ladies and gentlemen, it is 11 o'clock here in Leiden. I don't know what time it is where you are sitting at the moment. I hope it's not uh, too bad. Um, welcome this morning um, here from Leiden. It's beautiful weather. Uh, I hope you're all well and uh, not being too much affected by the corona epidemic. Um, my name is Willem Vogelsa. I'm the deputy director of the International Institute for Asian Studies. And for some time now, the last few months, we have been organizing uh, webinars, as we call it, uh, lectures given by uh, the fellows that uh, normally, and they still do, reside here in Leiden with us. Normally, it's, we call it lunch lectures, and which were organized here uh, in situ, here in the room I'm sitting in at the moment, uh, actually. But of course, because of the uh, corona pandemic, uh, we can't do that. So we organize these uh, webinars that uh, basically the whole world can, uh, can join in. Uh, for today, um, our speaker is uh, Giuseppe Capello um, from Italy. Uh, he has been a fellow here for, I think, quite some time, five, six months. Um, he has been working here also partly sponsored by what we call the Honda Foundation, which is um, uh, a fund, a foundation uh, run by the uh, Nellis Academy of uh, Arts and Sciences in Amsterdam. And um, based on an endowment uh, given by Professor Gonda, who was a famous, well, he was, I think, famous Indologist uh, in Utrecht. And um, when he died, he gave quite a large sum to enable uh, people from all over the world uh, to come to Holland and to pursue their studies in Indology, Sanskrit, but also other subjects relating to uh, the study of India. And uh, these fellows, um, partly paid for by the uh, Honda Foundation, they, um, they are welcomed here um, in my institute and they stay here for a while. They use the library here of uh, Leiden University and, and I hope uh, they have a good time and, uh, and I'm sure they are doing an awful lot of work. Now, one of the fellows from the Honda Foundation here is now Guizep and um, he's going to talk about quite an intriguing subject. It is an, uh, a Persian um, uh, piece which written by uh, Banwali Das from India. Uh, but it's based on a Sanskrit work. And uh, what uh, Bicep is going to talk about is how Banwali Das managed, or at least tried to manage, to translate uh, not only the words, etc., but also the ideas in this Sanskrit work into a more uh, uh, Muslim environment uh, that he was living and working in. So, uh, Bicep, can I see you? Hello. Good morning to everyone. We said, can I give, uh, before you yeah. start, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. people can also ask questions, but they have to ask them in written form. So in the chat modem that you all have. And uh, you can start your questions right away, which of course you will wait 10 minutes or so. But I will collect your questions and then uh, put them forward to Wizep. And uh, we said you will talk for about uh, half an hour, I understand, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, yes? Yeah. So when you, 30 you, minutes. Okay. When you are finished, I will collect uh, some of the questions that have been posed and uh, present them to you. Yeah? Okay, we said can I give the, the screen to you then? Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Okay, you. There you are. Okay, perfect. Okay. Good morning to everyone, and thank you for attending this webinar on the translation strategies and later the interconnections of the Gulzade Hall by Bangali Das. But before starting with my talk, I would like to thank the J. Gonda Foundation of the Loyal Academy of Arts and Sciences and the International Institute for Asian Studies that have supported my research here in Leiden and that have created the conditions to interact with scholars of different fields of research. Well, the focus of my lecture is the Gulzode Hall. The Gulzode Hall, or Rose Garden of Mystical Ecstasy, is a Persian adaptation of a Sanskrit drama entitled Prabodha Chandrudaya. Well, 
The Prabodha Chandrodaya has been composed around 1060 by an order named Krishna Mishra. Well, now imagine that the Prabodha Chandrodaya, that is an allegorical Sanskrit text, during the centuries acquired uh, a large notoriety among uh, Indian intellectuals and many Indian authors um, inspired by the allegorical plot of the Prabodha Chandrodaya composed new versions with similar uh, titles or, um, or different as well. The Gulzare Hall, the Rose Garden of Mystical Ecstasy, is one of the most successful versions of the Prabodha Chandrodaya. During my doctoral studies, uh, I traced back something like 50 manuscript copies of the Gulzare Hall that are available in India, Pakistan, and Europe. And I have analyzed 27 manuscripts. That uh, and that, and from such codicological analysis, I realized that the Gulzari Hall circulated among South Asian intellectual networks composed by both Hindu and Muslim uh, intellectuals. Well, the Gulzari Hall or Rose Garden of Mystical Ecstasy is a Persian adaptation. Well, but what made what make of the Gulzari Hall such a special piece? Well, the Gulzari Hall uh, adapts a Hindu allegorical plot into an Islamic mystical milieu. So I wonder why Hindu intellectuals accepted among their uh, spiritual readings a text such as the Gulzari Hall. And this was for me a very uh, intriguing question. Well, I think that uh, to answer uh, the, the answer to such question could benefit the field of intellectual history of South Asia. However, uh, I've been even uh, attracted by, interested by the, the intellectual depth of, Darash, of uh, Bambari Das, who born in a Hindu family, but soon showed an interest for Islamic mysticism. And because of such religious inclination, Bambaridas moved to Kashmir to become a disciple of a very famous uh, spiritual guy whose name is uh, Mullah Shah Badakhshi. Well, Mullah Shah himself, in the history of South Asian Sufism, is an important uh, historical character. Among the adepts of Mullah Shah were two members of the Mughal family, namely the Mughal Heira Padan, Dara Shuku, and his sister, Jahanura. Well, Dara Shuku himself was a refined intellectual uh, engaged in searching for an equivalence between Islamic mysticism and Hindu metaphysical traditions. So that we can understand that both uh, Darashuku and Bambali Das shared an interest in Islamic and Hindu metaphysical traditions and philosophies. Uh, because of this reason, and even because of Bambali Das's proficiency in, proficiency in uh, uh, Persian language and Persianate literary culture, Bambali Das became a, a secretary of Darashuku. And this is the second main reason that I decided to focus on the Gulzare Hall, because by analyzing the Gulzare Hall, we can understand how an intellectual close to Darashuku, an intellectual that was part of Darashuku's intellectual network, adapted a Hindu allegorical plot to an Islamic milieu, into an Islamic milieu through the medium of Persian. Now, to contextualize the Gulzari Hall in Mughal South Asia, it is important to say that from late 16th century on, Mughal imperials and nobles supported Persian translations of Sanskrit texts for 
uh, different political, social, cultural, and intellectual reasons. The case of the Gulzai Hall, somehow it's a case apart because Bambali Das completed the Gulzai Hall um, about 40 years, the death of his patron, Dada Shuku. But in spite of the lack of Dada Shuku's support, the Gulzari Hall, as I have already said, widely circulated among Indian intellectual circles of later times. Notwithstanding the notoriety of the Gulzari Hall, scholarly attention often has neglected uh, studies focused on this text, so that my research aims even to, uh, to fill, at least in part, such a gap of knowledge. Well, uh, this is not to say that there are not any studies focused on the Gulzari Hall and on Maridas. For example, here I mention uh, two lithographic editions published in India during the 19th century and one modern critical edition published in 1961 by the Aligarh Muslim University. And in... Uh, um, that in 2019, uh, Supriya Gandhi published an article on the Persian writings on Vedanta attributed to Bambari Das. And forthcoming is my article, The Gulzore Hall by Bambari Das, two possible prefaces of an Indo Persian text. Well, now my research is focusing on the translation strategies and the intellectual relations merged from the Gulzari Hall. As intellectual relations, I, I intend to say the uh, interconnections with texts, words, ideas emerged, that fr emerged from the Gulzari Hall that um, show, us, show us how Bambari Das articulated a dialogue with the Muslim scholars, both evil and predated him. Well, um, it is a difficult issue, I, uh, according to my opinion, because uh, we have to identify, on the one hand, um, interconnections with Advaita Vedanta doctrine, that is a, a philosophical doctrine, a Hindu philosophical doctrine, uh, on which is based the Prabuddha Chandrudaya. On the other hand, the Gurzore Hall is widely uh, inspired, is heavily inspired by Islamic Sufism. But what kind of Islamic Sufism? There are many elements emerged from the Gurzore Hall that uh, link to the so called Wahda Tal Vujud, or unity of being, that is a doctrine. Uh, very famous in early modern South Asia that is rooted in the idea of Ibn Arabi, a Muslim scholar born in Arab Spain and died in Damascus. Well, uh, the methodology, the approach that I used to uh, focus on the Gulzari Hall is largely based on uh, textual criticism, philology, uh, classical analysis of literary sources, and even uh, taking uh, techniques from uh, translation strategies. Well, uh, I will emphasize that it is by recognizing the interrelations with other, with other Muslim scholars both coeval, I repeat, and uh, predated Bambari Das, that we can define the Guzzare Hall as an adaptation and not as a translation of the Prabodha Chandra However, um, I've tried to uh, systematize the intellectual procedures that Bambari Das used to um, create his uh, adaptation of a Hindu allegorical text. And at the end, I found out a list of four main uh, procedures. Uh, 
namely the integration of Persian mystical poetries, the transliteration of Sanskrit names into Arabic Persian letters, the addition of Persian, of Persian interpretations of the Sanskrit names and rephrasing of the source text by Sufi words and Islamic religious quotations. Well, the first category, the first procedure, namely the integration of Persian mystical poetries, it's a way that Bambaridas used to articulate a dialogue with Muslim scholars. Here, I present to you an example that is for me very interesting because um, are three lines that constitute the very beginning of the goods of the whole. Three lines of a treaty composed in reality by Mullah Shah do you remember? The spiritual master of Bambaridas, so that the subtle meanings of such verses is, is emphasized by Bambaridas because he posed the, the verses at the very beginning of his piece. Now, uh, such verses come from the Rezoleye Murshid, or Treaty of the Spiritual Guide, a text by Mullah Shah Badakhshi. In these uh, lines, Mullah Shah emphasizes, emphasizes um, aspect crucial in Ibn Arabi thoughts. And such aspects are important according to the cosmogonical um, ideas of Ibn Arabi, namely ideas that deal with the origin and the organization of the natural world. Um, Mullah Shah and Bambaridas, through the words of his spiritual master, here want to say that God is present in all created things through his divine essence. And because of these presence that engender all created things, the natural, he is similar to the created things. But in the last but one line, namely when uh, Mulasha sings, you are not the world's root. Man, he is saying that man, you are not the world's root. He, namely God, will be the origin of world's existence. Mulasha is saying that God, yes, God is similar to created things, but in the meantime, he is something, something else from created things. Well, uh, the integration, the integration of mystical poetry is, is uh, just a way to articulate a dialogue with readers and with other Muslim scholars. Because uh, the other uh, procedures that Bambali does use, namely the transliteration of Sanskrit names into Arabic Persian letters and the addition of Persian interpretations of the Sanskrit names are two um, procedures that Bambali does largely used to articulate dialogues with the other scholars and ideas that influenced him. Um, the Sanskrit names of the characters are allegories of um, abstract concepts. Are Sanskrit technical words that Bambari does renders in Persian through interpretations so that he helped readers not uh, proficient in Sanskrit to understand the subtle meanings of uh, such Sanskrit terms. And it's by analyzing such Persian interpretations that we can understand how Bambali does try to, to search for an equivalence between, between two different cultures and how Bambali does attempted to uh, find co uh, points of contact between two different cultures. Well, um, to analyze such uh, to analyze such Persian interpretations, I resorted, uh, I profited from the studies of a scholar named Vladimir Ivir, who focused on the procedures and strategies for the translation of culture. 
Well, now I'm going to present to you a short list of character and their Persian interpretations. Such characters has been selected on the base of their cosmogonical importance, namely their importance in the origin and the organization of the natural world. Well, the first character I'm going to introduce to you is Pulusha, that uh, is usually translated as, as the self, the supreme self. Well, Pudusha in the Prabodha Chandrodaya, but even in the Gurzari Hall, is equivalent to the supreme self and to the universal soul, namely in Sanskrit. Pudusha is equivalent to the Atman and the Brahman. This is a basic, um, how to say, um, principle of uh, Advaita Vedanta doctrine. This is a doctrine system traditionally attributed to um, a scholar named Shankaracharya. And Shankaracharya uh, systematized a doctrine according to which whoever each spiritual liberation from the, the, the cycle of rebirth, namely samsara, by understanding that there is not any differentiation between Atman and Brahman, the Supreme Self and the Universal Soul. Here we find Purusha that ultimately is both Atman and Brahman. Well, Bambaridas translates Purusha through two procedures, namely cultural borrowing and definition. Cultural borrowing because um, the transliteration of Sanskrit terms into Arabic Persian letters, it's a kind of cultural borrowing. And then Bambaridas defines Purusha as ocean in all things. Well, um, ocean, it's a metaphor well, widely used in uh, um, Sufi literature. And uh, even in both uh, Bambaridas, but even before him, scholars such as Ibn Arabi and later uh, the Persian poet Jalal al-Din Rumi resorted to the metaphor of the ocean. Ibn Arabi, for example, envisioned the cosmos as a large green ocean from which uh, the, the waves emerge as the forms, the external forms, emerge from the ocean. To underline that there is not any differentiation between the waves and the ocean, as well as uh, between the, the forms and the cosmos. However, um, the integration of Persian poetries and uh, of Persian interpretations of Sanskrit terms are two ways that Bambaridas used to adapt the Hindu allegorical plot to an Islamic religious milieu. But Bambaridas um, even rephrased the source text by employing Sufi technical words, namely uh, a terminology that is rooted in Islamic tradition and in Islamic mystical traditions. For example, in a dialogue between two characters, namely King Discernment and uh, Intelligence, uh, they talk about Purusha, and by reading such dialogue, we can understand how uh, Bambaridas conceptualized, conceptualized the Purusha. Here we find the King Discernment says Purusha, namely light of essence, who is unlimited, endless, and not born from anyone, is without beginning and ending. That's enough. And intelligence of Purusha says that he is the pure light that appears and manifests in the form of all created beings. Here we find that Bambaridas rephrased the source text by presenting to present Purusha as the divine essence of God that is typical in the theory of, in the doctrine of Wahdat al Vujud. Well, the next character I introduce to you is 
Maya. Maya, illusion. Uh, and Vanvari does through the definition of Maya, that is power, description, and multitude, emphasizes the negative psychological effects of this character on those who attempt the spiritual path, path. Because Maya's tricky nature mag and Maya's magical power induce, induces him to taking what is conventionally real for, this, for what is ultimately real. So Van Validas, uh, through uh, his Persian interpretation, emphasizes this concept that is uh, typical of Advaita Vedanta doctrine, namely the, the definition of Maya as uh, a negative power that influences uh, spiritual practitioners. Another character is mind that Van Validas translates through um, renders through three, uh, three different names, Man, Del, and John. Well, Man, Del, and John share the meaning of mind. But Del, for example, means even heart and soul apart from mind. And John means even soul apart from mind. The ambiguity of Man, Del, and John once again emerge from uh, the poetries of the Persian poet uh, Jalal al Dumi, who uh, made not a clear distinction between the intellect, the heart, and the soul. Well, if we want to understand which is the meaning that Bambaridas attributed to mind, we have to bear in mind that the words of the heart is an allegory, and as such, it results to um, personification of concepts and things such as mind, because mind in Persian and literary culture is the organ delegated to perceive mystical realities, and in the Buddha the whole is the organ delegated to perceive what is the ultimate truth. Well, the last character that I would like to introduce to you is Ahamkara. Ahamkara is, the, is by no means an easy word to render in translation. And Bambaridas uh, did it through the Persian term Pendor. Pendor means pride, so that Ahamkara is pride. But Ahamkara, usually in uh, Sanskrit literature, is, uh, conveys the, the concept of ego sense. But in the Ramayana, Ahamkara is pride, haughtiness. So that Pendor, in this case, pride, um, links the Gurzore Hall to uh, such uh, epic Sanskrit tradition, namely that of the, the Ramayana. But uh, Pendor, apart from pride, means even um, thought, fancy, imagination. And in this case, thought, can render the idea of ego sense because it is through uh, mental processes that uh, human beings produce the wrong eye, the ego sense. So that Pandora, in this case, it's a cultural substitutive of ego sense. And cultural substitution is uh, a translation strategy that translators resort to when they the way when they do not find in the target culture a term that conveys uh, all the meanings of the of the original term so that because of the complexity of ahamkara bambaridas selected the term pendor that somehow covered the meanings of pride by a literal translation and of ego sense by a cultural substitution now, I would like to conclude this presentation emphasizing that uh, the Gurzore Hall is a text that defies Hindus, uh, Hindu and Muslim religious affiliations as we intend them nowadays. At the first sight, the rephrasing of the, of the source text by Sufi words and Islamic technical terms 
uh, could appear as a way to underline the supremacy of one tradition over the other. But uh, such terminology radicated, rooted in Islamic religious religion, in Islamic religion in South Asia during early modern period, um, conveyed to the audience um, more uh, subtle meanings, so that the interpretation of texts such as the Gurzore call require um, more levels of interpretation, and the terminology conveys to the audience uh, multiple re possible readings. Well, thank you for attending.